God's kingdom is a kingdom that operates in love and peace. And I think it might be very idealistic to think of God's kingdom being established on earth with a government of peace and love. But in reality, the others aren't doing too well. So why not try something else? You know, and why not see what God's solution is to the problems we face rather than trying to solve them with our human ingenuity? You know, and yeah, they may well enhance life and people will live to two or three hundred years of age because of technology. But I don't want technology to solve those problems. I want to live in what God intended rather than because what happens when they start monetizing the technology and charging you more than you can pay? You're going to die. You can't pay up because someone's going to make money out of it. And that's part of the problem with any solution, which is is on the basis of a capitalistic society. Someone's going to make money and someone has to pay for that. Do you find that uh, your relationship with God now is, uh, and when you just said more, you used the word just moments ago, relaxed. Um, it, has it changed like in the, how you spend your time? Like, was there more of a uh, routine when you got up, like went back 10 years ago? compared yeah. to what it is today and oh, yeah. how just how has that changed and yeah um i think while i was looking to develop and learn a lot of things uh, and god was talking to me a lot and wanted me to share what he was talking to me about with others as a source of encouragement then you know a regular time to engage with him and give him that sort of quality time uh which gave an opportunity for the conversations and the journaling and all the stuff that went on. Um, and that was fine. And that, that was part of the journey. And, and I look back on that with fond memories and, you know, and I think that probably continued up until um, 2021, I think maybe. And then when he said, stop doing the vision destiny series, it was like, Oh, okay, I'll stop doing that. But I carried on engaging. And then one day he said, why are you carrying on journaling stuff if I don't want you to share the journals? I'm like, oh, OK, I never thought of it like that. So so it was like, well, what do you want me to do? He said, well, just just enjoy. Uh, and so I that sort of was part of a process of. The union of relationship and when I learned to dwell in the presence of god in his personal presence not not just in the general presence of heaven but face to face and heart to heart in that realm of light uh, and i engaged in the realm of light and it became therefore a more of a cardiogenosis knowledge of the heart which was infused by my dwelling there and abiding there i didn't really need specific information and conversations because we were one you know, we were in union, so it didn't require the same communication style that I had when I was journaling um, our conversations. But I find that I know things um, and I just know those things from more of the heart of the father. And I think my relationship in love and unconditional love and first love and all of that has changed dramatically over that period. To become a state of being rather than me doing something in the relationship now i enjoy the relationship and that relationship therefore has also become part of everyday life in that i feel the father's pleasure of me enjoying life um and i feel he's with me and i'm with him all the time Therefore, you know, I was in the garden this morning. I planted some lettuce out that I'd grown and a few, some, some tomatoes and stuff. And, and as I was putting them in this raised bed thing that I made, like a planter, I just felt the father's pleasure on that. And it was like, yeah, it felt like, oh, yeah, that's my boy. In that I'd made the planter, I'd grown the seeds, I'd done all this stuff, and it was part of my creative identity. Um, and... And I sort of nurtured and tended those plants, you know, and I and I was like putting them in the in the in the planter 
and I just felt God's pleasure on it. And I felt as I looked around and I saw the cherries on the cherry tree all growing, and I just felt that connection to creation in that it's not a, well, you've got to do this and this and this today. You know, there's a sense of I'm being in this relationship rather than, well, I'm working at it or I need to do this or what should I be doing? And I think that's changed from my understanding of my destiny and my scroll from, well, here's all the things that you're going to be doing to, well, this is who you are. And everything you do from who you are is part of your scroll. But there isn't a list of things. There is just the being who I am that unveils something which is my sonship in relationship with the father in that way. So things have definitely changed. And that I don't get up and have a quiet time with God every day because he didn't want me to, you know, because that would be going back to what the relationship was. No, if he asked me to, of course I would. But I don't need to because I'm aware of his presence all the time. And I'm conscious of his love for me and the joy that I feel. And so you know, that whole living loved dimension has taken a completely different perspective. And I look back and see lots of different perspectives where I start with learning things and discovering things and finding out how things work to that becoming, I am becoming that which I learned. And now that is me. I don't have to think about, well, I've got to do this or this. Or I, it's just who I am. And therefore, that is my state of being now. So the whole multidimensional reality of being in multiple places, doing multiple things was part of that discovering, hey, I don't have to be doing all of this stuff all of the time. I am doing it. This is who I am in that sense. You know, I'm multiple places doing multiple things all out of the father's heart. And I don't have to be, you know, cognitive of it all if I don't want to be. I'm, but I'm aware whenever and I'm, and I'm still connected to all of that because that's who I am. You know, my spirit might be doing it, but my soul is still connected and therefore I'm still benefiting from all that I'm doing. And I can, and I'm aware in a sense of things that I didn't know in a cognitive sense. I am aware that I talk about things and I'm talking about it from a different perspective. And I didn't learn that in a cognitive way i i just received that in my relationship the father's heart revealed it you know when jesus only did what he saw the father doing it wasn't uh well jesus got up early and went and found the list for today he was continually engaged with the father the father was in him they had a relationship that freed jesus just to be you know and of course he had things that outworked who he was ultimately you know taking on our death and all of that um he was aware but it, it was all in relationship and the father you know i love when the father sort of said this is my beloved son in whom i'm well pleased you know in reality is he hadn't done anything particularly at that point at the beginning of his ministry but the father wasn't pleased because of what he was going to do he was pleased because he who he is and who he who who he is as a son and the relationship that they had. And I think that's what's changed. I think I I am enjoying living life in relationship with God in a state of conscious awareness of that relationship, which gives me a better connection to creation. Because I'm enjoying for me that that does mean the outdoors and the garden and the workshop and doing things and making things and just you know and i like i like that and i know the father likes that you know so i'm always looking for the next project because i enjoy making stuff but but if i didn't have one i wouldn't equally feel a problem with that so you know last year last week i put a new roof on the shed used the leftover bits to make a like a boot thing and bin thing for outside the back door and, you know, put a roof on that, you know, and made that, you know, now the next few days probably will just be gardening and, 
you know, we got no Mo May, which I really don't like. You know, the, the lawn's a mess. But Debbie likes it. No Mo May. All the buttercups and the daisies are all growing. And I'm like looking at it and thinking, oh, I hope anyone doesn't see this. It's a mess, you know. But hey, it's, it's all right. You know, I just, I, I'm counting down the days. I've got 20, 11 days until I can cut the grass, you know, and make more <laughs> compost. You know? But I, I, I operate differently. See, last year, at the beginning of last year, I was on it. Because I didn't go, I didn't, I was in, in March when everything started growing, I was on it in the garden. Therefore, I, I kept all the weeds down. I had everything looking really nice. But this year we were away in March and I was thinking, you know, oh, I'm going to come back and there's going to be weeds everywhere and everything like that. And when I got back, I felt, yeah, those weeds are my compost. You know, so I thought I'm going to let them grow until they get to the point where you know, I don't want them seeding everywhere, but I'm going to let them grow. And I let them grow. And now I harvested them as they are benefiting the garden because they're going to produce compost, which I'm going to add back to the soil. And I'm going to use this sort of circle of life type of thing in for, to my benefit and for the benefit of the garden. So, you know, and therefore I found that some of them flowered with quite nice little flowers. You know, I never let them grow that big before. So this time I've let the let them flower and then harvested them before they go to seed. And and I really felt that there was a connection to all of that, which is much more intuitive um, than previously. My I would have been oh weeds, but now I see no weeds are good because they actually grow really fast, really big, most of them. And they produce a lot of green material for my compost bins. You know, my compost bins are absolutely crammed now full. You know, uh, I harvested a whole load of compost from last year and in my hot composter yesterday. Um, now, so they're all ready for planting the vegetables out this week. Um, and so it's, it feels like life is to be enjoyed, but in a connection with God and creation, not well, here's all the things I need to be doing, you know, and I don't get up to in the morning thinking, oh, what have I got to do today? I just feel the pleasure and the joy of God that we're going to be together and whatever I'm going to be doing today is going to be fun and I'm going to rejoice in it and celebrate it and be thankful and grateful that I've got a garden and I've got trees, you know, and I manage it. And, you know, I, uh, and I look at it from the point of, OK, how do I create nurture this environment? And sometimes that means you have to chop things down. You know, we had four big conifer trees, which were which had been just growing and growing and growing. And they were blocking out our solar panels. So I thought, well, I need to chop them down. You know, now I thought, oh, I you know, how are they going to feel? But it's like, no, they've grown too big. So I'm going to chop them down, you know, and they'll regrow from the bomb and I'll manage it differently. But so I did. So, you know, I got the chainsaw and worked out a way of managing to chop down 60 foot trees with a greenhouse and a road and a workshop in a little piece. But all of that was part of the sort of creative managing and tending. Now I've got a whole load of logs. So I got a log splitter, cut all the logs up, built a new log store. So, you know, cleared all the back of the workshop, which was just a dumping ground for all of the branches and stuff that I wanted to sort of leaves to come off and cleared it all, put in a four, three or four meter, you know, thing. And it, it all feels like I am tending and cultivating and looking after everything. And that's bringing pleasure to God. It's bringing pleasure to me. I enjoy it. You know, now we've got a nice wood store. Debbie likes stacking up logs. You know, I chop the logs, get them all ready. She stacks them up and everything's great. You know, and, you know, I had four dumpy bags full of twigs and stuff, which are now virtually all stacked and everything's great. Now I'm sort of harvesting all of the weeds and I'm going to have lots of lovely compost. So every, everything feels enjoyable and joyful. And I think that's changed from 
I wouldn't have had the time to do that in a way, or I would have thought other things are more important to do when actually I realize, no, they're not. I don't separate up this and that and the other. I enjoy and God enjoys and everything's much more relaxed and fun. Um, you know. Two, two follow-up questions. One, yeah. Yeah. Um, if uh, there wasn't the fall, is that how, I don't know, is that what would have happened? Would, is that how we were supposed to live? Like you, like somewhat like you are in relationship with God and that would have been the history of the earth. And uh, the second one being the difficulty being as I listen to you is how you enjoy life and it's, it, the, you're more relaxed in that. And I'm thinking about the, the dad or the mom in the States of both or Canada that, you know, with inflation now at 19.1%, they both work in jobs, can't make ends meet. Yeah. They, you know, the kids running around and all that. And it becomes all the cares of life makes it so difficult for them because they're, tr they're and they, some of them, sometimes they lose their jobs or whatever else, but it's just trying to, it's a survival mode life. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I understand that. And, and in a sense, I understand that I'm in a privileged position in that, I am not having to bring up the children and and do all that. Um, but if I was, I still feel that I could do it with a sense of joy. Because if God is my provider and I'm out working, being a father, being a husband, being all of those things, whatever I'm doing with the same attitude, then I could still find the same pleasure in it because I'm not doing it to make ends meet or I'm not doing it because of the problems with the economy and all of that, I'm still doing it in relationship. Therefore, yes, my time would be spent doing different things, but each of those different things is could be equally as valuable and equally as jo enjoyable because it's my mindset that makes something enjoyable, not what I'm doing. You know, I'm digging a hole. Most people would, wouldn't find that enjoyable, you mm. know, because it's like, oh, it's clay. I've got to dig all the way down and make a pond, you know. But while I'm making, while I'm digging the hole for a pond, which we now we've got the pond. I was looking forward to the enjoyment of what I was doing, even when I was doing it. And it was really hard work. And, you know, and, the, and you know, it was so funny. I mean, I dug four feet pond, this big pond, the four feet, because I wanted to sort of have it deep and whatever in some places. I would have came over to help you build it. <laughs> and it was so much funny, funnier that I got to the last bit and this the next door neighbor came around and said, oh, I've got I've got a petrol auger you could have used to, to dig down all of that. So I thought, see, oh, do you want to do it for the last foot? I thought, well, OK, thank you. Thanks. You know, it would be really nice if you'd said that three days ago. But actually, you know, but I did. I used the petrol auger to dig down the last foot or so because I could dig down easier with this thing. You know, but I was looking forward to the enjoyment that it would produce, not the hard work of doing it. So, yeah, when you're bringing up children and you've got you got job and you're trying to make ends meet and all of that stuff, it's the mindset you have towards it, I think, which is important. It's not what you're doing. It's how you're doing it and with what mindset and attitude that you do it with. And if you do it begrudgingly or with worry and anxiety and I've got to do this and I've got to do this and, I, you know, how am I going to make this meet? Well, you know, that's where our relationship with God brings us to the point where I trust him for my provision. One way or another, he will provide for all that I need and for an abundance of every good deed, which means I can be me, you know. And I understand that there are times in life, you let's say you're homeschooling four children, you are going to have a lot less time than a person who's retired or at an age where they're able to relax you know but what do you do in bringing up the children how do you homeschool them is it a chore or are you rejoicing in sowing into their lives that is going to produce fruit so they can also know who they are because what you'll be doing is not giving them information you will be investing in helping them discover who they are so everything I think can be, you can see it as a chore or 
one way or you can see it a different way. And if you see it and find the joy and the thanksgiving and gratitude in it, no matter what you're doing, can still be from a state of um, where you are seeing, feeling and sensing God's pleasure in what you're doing, even though you might think, well, I haven't got enough time for this. And, you know, I'd like to spend more time with God. Well, you are spending time with God. If your attitude is God's with me in this while I'm doing this job or while I'm doing bringing up the children or while I'm homeschooling them or whatever it might be. If you see that God is with you, there is a union and there is no separation and God is not into secular or religious. It's just life. Then life can be enjoyed no matter what you're doing. And as the seasons of life change, so you can enjoy those seasons in the same way that you're producing and enjoying the previous seasons. And I think it's attitude and the mindset towards it that counts, not what you're doing but how you're doing it with the right attitude towards it and the enjoyment that you find in it because you're doing it with God. You know, and I know looking back, I, I know if I had enjoyed life in the past, the way I'm enjoying it now, everything, everyone and everything would have benefited much better from that because I'm a better version of me. You're like, because uh, I've discovered that God loves me unconditionally and he isn't pressurizing me into a whole load of things. Now, of course, I learned on the way lots of things to get me to this point. And there are lots of moments on the journey where sometimes God reminds me of uh, crossroads where you made this decision to go this direction, you know, and, and I look back and think, oh, I'm glad I didn't go the other direction. You know, um, but if I had taken the other direction, God could have still brought me to the same place because he's always going to bring good out of everything in our lives. And I understand, you know, that it is difficult for people because they have a mindset that probably values certain things above other things, where if you value everything in life the same, you don't prioritize those things in the same way or think lesser of other things. You know, and God wants to, us to be aware of his presence in everything we do um, and not to feel guilty or contemned that we're not doing what we think we should do or what we've been conditioned to do by religion. Well, you've got to read your Bible every day. You've got to pray every day. You've got to witness. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. You've got to do this. Well, who says? You know, God didn't tell me to do that. I chose to do that because... I thought that was the thing I should do. No, God used me doing that and I, and God used me in it and he taught me in it and he shared stuff in it. But if I'd done it a different way, he could have done it the same. He could have still brought me to the same place. And I would have not had to jettison all the religious stuff along the way and get deconstructed in, in a way because I wouldn't have had all of that stuff operating in my life. So, yeah, the other question about the fall, what if, what if it didn't happen? I think it's a difficult one because we might have a mindset that sort of frames it in a particular way. Like, well, God had them walking in a garden and he walked with them in the garden and they tended and cultivated the garden. OK, so would have that been life forever? I don't think so. Because as they increased in number, would everyone have been walking around in a garden all day, every day? I don't think so. I think the creativity that we have in God would, you know, the infrastructure of the planet wouldn't have coped with 50 billion people all walking around naked in a garden. You know, I don't think that was the intention that God will have that that continued now the relationship of a garden and our engagement with creation to tend and cultivate it would have continued but i think we would have actually grown lived in in places not just slept out on the grass or whatever you know it doesn't say where adam and eve slept does it you know just as they walked with god in the cool of the day and they were told to tend and cultivate the garden did they did they sleep in a hammock? Who knows? We don't know. But in reality, I think if if 
they hadn't have chosen independence in which then they had to come up with their own solution to the world's problems of increasing population and all of that stuff. I think we would have created things rather than made things. So we've made things out of wood, stone, metal, which we had to work at the sweat of our brow to produce. And the evil of hard work and labor in a way which is independent of God, which makes you weary and heavy laden. An evil word, poneros, evil means hard labor, hardship, toil, sweat, you know, and actually God didn't intend us to live that way. So let's say the population increased and there was, you know, went from hundreds to thousands to hundreds of thousands. I believe that they would have learned to create things to live in. And I think they would have been very, or they would have been made out of not the earth or the trees or anything else. They would have been a product because you wouldn't, most of what our material is today and our rocks are the result of sedimentation and igneous activity or volcanic activity, which there wouldn't have been if there was no fall. So it wouldn't have had that material. Therefore, there wouldn't have been molten iron within rocks in the same way that there is now. So what would we have done? Well, if we had continued to ascend into sonship, we would have done like the father did. He called things that be not as if they are. So creatively, free from any negative ways of thinking, I believe we would have had beautiful structures created by choice to live in and to grow in. And we would have had energy and water and food and everything else we needed without the toil, labor and hardship that we have got to in producing that. And therefore, the society which is based on materialism and greed and the economy controlled by those who want more and more money and people being poor. There would have been no poverty. There would have been no one who had more money than anyone else because money wouldn't have existed. Money only reflects the value of your work. If you do things because it's who you are, you don't need to be paid a monetary value on that because you value who you are and the time you take to do something. Yes. Therefore, our whole mindset would have been different. And it's one of those things you can't go back and think. Well, you can. I think about it a lot because I think about, well, what what is our future going to be if we come back to that restored state? You know, if I'm going to create things in the future, how am I going to encourage that to flourish and live and whatever? So I do think about it. And I think, you know, if we had the thing over how things work and how things operate then they would be under our direction not the other way around so the certain law scientific laws that exist and the quantum mechanical way that things can be observed and created we would have used that to form things out of light and they would have been beautiful and they would have been perfectly functional and we would have had buildings that looked very differently from our buildings today which we're using out of material and we may well have lived in in ways um, which are very different from today but i think we would have also by now been on other moons and planets and we would have expanded because we had access to the gateways that took us to other planets and would took us around the universe and we would have taken that place of peace and joy once we had completely heavenized if you like this planet we would have continued to other planets and we would have increased and multiplied and taken god's government of peace out into all the other things and the dimensions also we would have been able to engage those dimensions in a way which we've not been able to because of the nature of our fall and the fact that our fall affected those other dimensions in negative ways which wouldn't have done because it wouldn't have happened 
so it's sort of a huge topic to think about what would it have been like if that hadn't have happened um but i i do do it sometimes and and people ask questions about it sometimes and i think well we can't come from our present understanding and try and do it in a way that leans to our understanding which has been created out of our past experience because we wouldn't have had those past experiences and actually those past experiences are the us doing the best we can in our own strength independently of god and i'm not saying some of the things we've done aren't beautiful and have been amazing because we are creative and we're made in the image of god and therefore we still are reflecting some of that in what we're doing but the way it functions is absolutely not how god intends you know the way people live within the societies that we've created where there's such inequality where there's such degradation and sickness and disease and poverty and all of those things there would have none been none of that therefore you know life would have been very different and i believe if we're going to see restoration then we need to be thinking differently rather than making things better using what we have as a basis let's start thinking about how we would create something completely different rather than oh well we're going to redeem these seven mountains of culture that we've created we're not because i don't believe those seven mountains of culture were god's idea in the first place so we may have mountains of or, or of creational things that we might be involved in but I believe they will be very different when we think differently and therefore we've got to have our minds renewed so that we're not replicating the mistakes that we made when we did all these things in the past because as much as we've increased in technology and everything else there's still huge poverty there's still major diseases there's still people dying all over the world through malaria and other things if malaria was in New York or Washington, I guarantee there would be a completely malarial free country. Um, but because it's in Africa, the incentive to actually do it is not there because it's not affecting us. And I think that sort of amounts to the selfishness in which we live. We live in societies which are very self-centered and are not thinking in a terms of the whole. And therefore, I think that would be very different and our mindsets and belief systems towards how we live would be very different and we wouldn't have all the political systems and all of the things we've made to try and manage a imperfect society in an imperfect world we would be living in a completely different way and i think we should be thinking about how we could live heaven on earth rather than how can we repair and make it better the things we've done there's got to be a better solution to it not a you know i'm looking at society and, and what can we put in place to make this society better you know so, so rather than a tri tribulation sorry, rather than a tribulation that, that's the way you see it Ineb inevitably it's going to go um tribulation as in well, I, well, our uh, many many uh, Christians and other religions think you know what's going to happen is just gonna, we're on the eve of destruction from that old, oh, yeah, yeah. and in fact, yeah. inevitably, you see it. This is the way it's going to go. Oh yeah, I mean, I I see things are going to get better when we start to bring heaven to earth, rather than trying to deal with the issues we've got in the way it's we're trying to deal with it. I believe that those systems will eventually collapse and, and be of no use and people will realize this isn't the way to go. So I believe people in eventually will find our human governmental systems are all totally flawed. We need something which operates. Oh, what is that? Oh, there's God's kingdom and peace. You know, so but we need demonstrations of God's kingdom and peace so that people can see there's an alternative to what we're doing right now. And therefore, we need to establish on earth as it is in heaven. We need to live on earth as it is in heaven. We need to live free from disease and, and the 
things which are driving society and live in a place of peace and rest, live in a place that in valuing things on how much they're worth and value changes when you appreciate value comes from who the person is, not what they can do. You know, and what they do is a blessing to other people and they enjoy blessing other people. So outworking who they are is just a blessing. Um, they're blessed to be a blessing. And I think I don't believe that what we have created is going to continue as it is or made better. I think we've done what we can do, the best we can do in our own independence. And it's you know, nowhere near anything like God intends us to live. Therefore, I think people will have to come to a realization and stop trying to prop it up and make it better and realize there's a better way. And we can do things in a completely different way. But obviously, the, the agenda that drives the world, which is financial and, and power and all of that stuff, has to come to an end. In a sense, or people will come to a realization that it's not the right way. Yeah, that it doesn't work that it's actually just perpetuating the same old things that have been there from the beginning. Let's make a name for ourselves and build us ourselves a big city, you know, and a tower which will reach to heaven, you know. It's like, that's still there. People are still building empires. They call them nations and ideologies or whatever, but they're still doing it. And they're still making a name for themselves. Until we see that God's name and the glorification of God's name is actually something which will bring about you know a change then we're just going to keep going around in circles you know so i do think that there may well be shaking of these systems or the failure of these systems in that people will begin to realize that we're we're, we're not this isn't it we're not accomplishing anything by just rehashing the same old things over and over again and giving them different titles and names because they're all independent humanistic solutions to what primarily is a spiritual problem. We've lost our identity in our relationship with God. And if we get it back, things will change. Yeah, But I don't believe that is God's judgment on the world. God loves the world. He, Jesus came to take away the lost identity of the world so the world could be re-established in a new identity as a new creation in Christ. You know, that still needs to take place. Therefore, an awakening to the world, to who God really is in love, will be what facilitates, I think, people turning away from those old humanistic systems and looking to establish and see God's kingdom established on earth as it is in heaven. I think it's interesting how you said about malaria because I heard uh, uh, on the news about uh, um, the American sort of complaining about the open border and a lot of malaria is coming up from South America. <laughs> well, if the big pharma companies turned their attention towards eradicating malaria free, then it would soon be eradicated. But of course, the third world doesn't pay much money, does it? So, but once it starts impinging on our territory, maybe there'll be more incentive to try and find solutions to it. And they have solutions. Yeah. They can genetically change malaria DNA to actually make it that it is doesn't carry disease. You know, they can do it. There's just no incentive to do it yet, but maybe there will be. You know, but they're more interested in keeping people out than solving the people's problems who are, who are out. You know, if they did dealt with malaria, then they wouldn't be worried about people bringing malaria into the country and all that. You know, and and sort of and as climate changes and if climate is getting hotter, well, maybe there'll be more that stuff starts to come in and therefore there will be more incentive to ch help find a solution to it. You know, but ultimately, if creation is brought back into harmony and balance, then there won't be malaria because those insects won't bite us. You know, and and that's the thing when you look back and find, you know, whenever I go to a country that's got malaria, I don't take anti-malarials. You know, I just I just know that, that I'm not going to be bitten. And I've never been bitten. Even though people I've been with have been bitten, I've not been bitten, so I don't bother with malaria or anti-malarials. You know, and 
because my mindset is towards, well, why would those things bite me? They'll die if they bite me. They're not going to bite me. The same thing as, you know, um, the thing where the plague thing, yeah, where where John, is it John G. Lake and the whole thing with the plague and it's like he went in and tended to people with plague because no one would want to do it and he just said, well, look, see what happens when plague stuff touches me, dies, you know, so he didn't have any fear associated with that type of thing and I think, you know, ultimately... You know, we need to make sure that we're not driven by fear in any way. And people are still operating very selfishly and in self-centered ways and looking at, you know, what benefits me the most. And I'll want the best system in place that benefits me the most rather than a system which benefits everybody and the rest of the world. You know, and until we stop operating selfishly and independently, then it will car keep carrying on. And we won't find a solution, you know. We've obviously got, oh, we've got an election this year. The US have got an election this year. You know, you've got a whole thing of, oh, well, is this going to bring about any change? No, it won't. No matter who's in, it's not going to solve the problems. You know, there may be slightly different orientation about what priorities they do things. But, you know, why do people want a particular political system? Generally, because they think mostly that it benefits them. You know, I was talking to a lady the other day and we were talking about, well, you know, why do you vote in this certain change? Well, I said, well, originally I would have voted on the basis of conscience. And then God told me to vote on the basis of whatever he told me to do, which is what I'll do now. Um, and she said, well, I vote on economics. So I said, well, is that is that a godly thing or is that something? Well, I'm an economist. I, I did a degree in in economy you know in economics oh so so you're so you're voting on the basis of the the party that will produce the best economics for the country okay well if that's what you want to do fine but i would maybe ask god what he might want you to do and not just assume it's going to be based on economics but who knows you know at the end of the day none of those systems are going to produce the changes that are required to bring about a society which is living in joy and peace and rest because you know whenever you've got a two-party system pretty much you're gonna you're gonna disappoint half of the people <laughs> and you're gonna have half of the people very disgruntled because their party didn't win and therefore you got division you know it just doesn't work you know but it's probably better than a dictatorship because that's all on the basis of one person's desire, you know, um, and other systems don't work either because people are imperfect and they don't work because people can't make them work. You know, so ultimately God's kingdom is a kingdom that operates in love and peace. And I think it might be very idealistic to think of God's kingdom being established on earth with a government of peace and love. But in reality, the others aren't doing too well. So why not try something else? You know, and why not see what God's solution is to the problems we face rather than trying to solve them with our human ingenuity? You know, and yeah, they may well enhance life and people will live to two or three hundred years of age because of technology. But I don't want technology to solve those problems. I want to live in what god intended rather than because what happens when they start monetizing the technology and charging you more than you can pay you're going to die you can't pay up because someone's going to make money out of it and that's part of the problem with any solution which is is on the basis of a capitalistic society someone's going to make money and someone has to pay for that you know and i guess you know if, if there is technology which will enhance life and people are going to die without it, well, I guess it's better than not having and dying. But ultimately, I think we need to find a solution in God rather than in our own ingenuity. And I know people will say, well, that is God giving us that. Some of that might be true that he does inspire people, but actually most of what gets inspired ends up in making people money and other people end up being poor. 
you know, and I'm not really sure that's how God intends discoveries and inventions and things to be used. They should be there to benefit people, not to benefit a few, you know. Um, but, you know, we're in this transition. So it's hard when you're in a transition to see something different while you're still living in what is present. Which is why I think we've been given an imagination and the ability to dream and to think differently and not be constrained by the past. You know, but look to a different future, you know, choosing the future that we want to live in an alignment with God's heart rather than being restricted to staying where we are and living in what we've got. But even being said, I still enjoy life. You know, it may not be ideal and perfect in a global sense, but I still live within my own created environment, if you like, because I choose to manage my environment in a sense of peace and rest. But I obviously don't want to live in a bubble which other people are not able to live in. I want everyone to live in a state of joy and peace and rest, which means infiltration of leaven into the whole lump ultimately which is to me one person getting it and finding who they are in god at a time until it increases and increases and increases until more people are choosing god's kingdom than are choosing their own yeah. which is coming you know because it's increasing it may not be increasing at the pace we'd like it but actually we we've, we've got to demonstrate it in such a way that we bring to choose that reality of awakening people to god's love but we're not going to do it by following old religious paradigms of revival and everything else we've got to find a new way of expressing how god wants us to live so that people will want to live that way i don't people are going to want to go to church three times on a sunday and you know give 10 percent of their money away you know i just don't think that's it's, it's a paradigm that people have rejected, you know, and therefore, well, what is heaven on earth? What does it look like to live God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven? Well, I've got to work for my life first. If I can't live that in my own life and live in joy and peace, then in spite of the fact that it's not perfect, then I'm not going to change things, you know, going forward. And I think God is inspiring people to begin to think about immortality and things like that because if you think about immortality you've got to plan for the future because you're going to be around for it if you believe you're going to be rescued or you're going to die and go to heaven you don't plan for the future or look for the next generation and the next generation and the next generation because you're not going to be around for it so what's the point you know and actually that's how people have been and they've been trapped in this thing well jesus is coming back we're all going to get rescued. The, the earth is going to be destroyed by fire and we'll get a new one, sort of. You know, and that, that mindset has kept people from looking at, well, what is the future that God intends? Um, Mike, that the um, talking about uh, making money, Mind Valley uh, on uh, Facebook, I saw an ad and um, this gentleman, he's an elderly man. He was quantumly jumping to his future, choosing a different future uh, for himself. And then he would come back into the present and be able to manifest it. So like he didn't know anything about art. So he jumped into the future, uh, got the knowledge of an artist, came back and all of a sudden sold all these paintings and then went to the future and was a musician. And, and so, so, you know, people are actually thinking that way that they can change their present with with you know knowledge from choosing different futures yeah i mean do i believe that he actually went to a future that doesn't yet exist no but he he in his own mind was exploring the possibilities of who he could be and the freedom to be that person and therefore his mind is creating that with the creativity that he's been given in god he didn't go to the future, get a download of what had happened. I don't believe. But I do believe that if we focus on God's intention and ultimately some of these guys who are doing this sort of stuff 
are not necessarily doing it in relationship with God. So are, is what they're doing still self-centered, all about how much he's got and how much he's earned and how many paintings he can sell, or does it carry with it God's intention for the world to be blessed? And I think that's the danger of using formulaic techniques, which do work, to create a better present or to generate your own future but is it selfish what is it based in is it god's intention or is it our own intention because we can still create things out of our own intention because it works you know i'm not saying these quantum things don't work they can work but are they still recreating a still a problem because it's all based in self-centeredness or are we looking at what is God's solution for a global thing rather than just for me? You know, rather than going forward and finding, oh, I can I can be a painter or, an, or a musician or whatever, and I can make money. Be like, how what is the future in terms of eradication of disease or, you know, other things which to me would be a global value rather than just me creating something better for myself. And I think that's the danger for some of the things that I've seen are operating in these fields of quantum, you know, focus and quantum fields and all of that stuff. It still seems to be quite self-centered. I know some of them are looking at healing, but it's healing for the person, not the healing for the world. You know, and I've, I've sort of got a feeling that although these things work, they're not the full picture. Because I don't think God is included at the center of it it's not christ centric you know it's still self-centered and i still think it's a manifestation that comes out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil even though it might be using some good knowledge it may not be totally how god intends us to use that knowledge perhaps i don't know you know i don't really sort of follow those sort of people but i know people who do and i'm aware of their names and i'm you know, but it doesn't have, for me, it doesn't have anything that draws me to it as a frequency, as a, I don't want to resonate with it, even though I can see that people could use those things and actually work it. But are they working it in for God or are they working it for themselves? You know. Mike, you were talking, it seems like imagination is important imagine things and, and and you go into flow i guess with god and interesting enough with our seven-year-old granddaughter was with us yesterday debbie and i mm -hmm. and uh it was in early in the morning like eight o'clock or whatever she turned off the tv she had some cartoons on and she said let's go to our, our my garden mm -hmm. so we said okay and I, debbie's on one side i'm on the other side and she said, let's go first years, Grandma. And we went to hers. And then we went to Papa's. And then she said, mine. Now, here was the interesting thing in her garden. She brought us to a place. And I don't know if I was. <laughs> but I might have gone into her imagination. But she always has dreamed, wanted to go to places like Walt Disney World. Mm. And she had created rides in her garden, which I thought my religious self would be like, oh, this is cat curring or something. You can't be doing <laughs> yeah. this. And I thought, no, but you're, she's using her imagination. I said, and we were talking away. And I said, do you go to your garden often, sweetie? And she said, oh, when I'm at school, I go to my garden. I go to my garden. And I thought, well, that's probably the way God starts with little kids. I don't know. Yeah, why not? It, it's very different from actually man of seeing heaven looks like that, which it doesn't, yeah. to actually, I mean, my garden is created out of my desire for, plants and things which are nature because i'm nature orientated other people could create things which are fun and enjoyable because it's her place place safe place of enjoyment yeah and i don't think god's gonna have a problem with her enjoying life in her imagination of creating a safe place and an enjoyable place for her to express that why not if she's 50 years old and she's still going to the fun fair and it's still, I think probably it's not, not gone on because it's a starting point. And if she learns that and she, as she connects with God, God's heart will inspire her to begin to create things and to live from a different place. 
because at the moment she's a child. Well, child loved Disney rides. You know, why wouldn't you want to create something like that to enjoy? You know, and actually, maybe she'll become a, a ride designer. Who knows? You know, if she follows, and that could be something which is her creative expression. But if she continues to develop her relationship with God, God can share his heart with her. So her creativity and her imagination can be used in a broader sense for a bigger purpose. Awesome. But no problem with her enjoying developing. And she, and she saw Jesus in her garden and he was yeah. there. And that's where it really threw me. I think, am I yeah. really in her garden or am I in her imagination? Have I got in her imagination? But he was there too. And I thought, but these are right. But why wouldn't he want to enjoy life with her? He's yeah. there when I'm building something in the workshop. But that's my mindset, I guess. Yeah. And I think that's the thing. Make sure you don't put your limitations on her, but encourage her to continue to grow in that. And, and to, you know, definitely encourage her. And, you know, don't do anything to put her off that. Because why wouldn't Jesus enjoy her being creative? She's a child. She should be doing things which children do and enjoy and, and, and have fun with. You know, if, if she continues in life, able to live in a, in a place, then that will only grow and develop into a very rounded, well-balanced place. You know, and she needs a safe place. You know, and if she can go to a safe place and find that safe place, and it's her, so long as it doesn't become a a prison for her mind because she's afraid of coming out of it then it's okay to to explore and to develop you know my garden was planted with plants i like i didn't ask anyone else's advice what they would want in my garden i chose the plants in my garden that were things that i liked to grow you know and yeah i also planted some things that don't exist in this world in my garden out of my creative choice of thinking, well, I, I like color. Why can't I have a rainbow plant or this, that, and the other? Because so my garden is populated with some plants and animals which are very different from what exist on earth. Because it's my garden. I can create what I like in there. You know, I have the, the first time I ever created anything by thought, which was a bird, which had, you know, so plumage, rainbow plumage and beautiful yellow and blue feathers and whatever, that is flying around in my garden. Because it's my creation. So I, I can still see it and enjoy it because that's what it's about. It was about enjoying it. And she had bees uh, making honey and she was eating the honey. And, you yeah. know. Why not? Yeah. You know, I, why not at all? And I and I think that that sense of creative, if we can get our children, grandchildren creatively exploring their imagination in a place with God, then that imagination, that state of being is going to expand and produce the solutions that we are looking for in the future. Because they'll be creative solutions. You know, um, but in tune with the heart of God. Yeah. So I think that's really exciting. You know, that she's able to do that and, and share it with you. That's the thing. You get to share in her joy, which is wonderful. And she probably look at your garden. Oh, it's a bit boring in here. You know? <laughs> yeah, Mine's really, my I, garden's I, religious. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, it's like, what's this? Yeah. <laughs> Very funny, wouldn't it? It's like, well, can you can't you make some something in here for me? But in my garden, the first experience of my own garden, what was it? A tree with a swing mm. that I sat on and God pushed me and swung me and gave me fun. I never forgot that. I never forgot my first experience of that garden was one of innocence and one which God showed me what it, he was my dad. And he wanted me to enjoy because I love being on swings. You know, my intention was, could I ever go right round? Obviously, you know, the physics is you can't, you know, without a massive push from something external. But actually, in my own mind, when I was a kid, I used to try, you know, I used to try and get as high as I could possibly get on the swing. 
you know. Um, but God knew that. So God pushed me. Now, he didn't push me all the way, all the way around. But I had that experience with him in which he took something which he knew I enjoyed and he shared it with me in that place. Yeah, you know, which I think goes to show God is not what we think he is. Yeah. Um, you know, he takes the time to spend with us in enjoyable moments, which that was, and that set the pattern for my garden. You know, I enjoyed it and I celebrated it, you know, and I, you know, went on the river of life and floated around in it. You know, and actually that was a process. Well, not that I knew it at the time, but that flowing where the river went took me to places of knowledge and identity and destiny and transformation you know, and it started with the relationship within the garden of my heart, which was God saying, I want this intimacy of relationship with you. You know, and it felt that way. You know, it was it was such an innocent sort of start to know knowing something I didn't know anything about. I didn't know I had a garden in my heart. You know, it's like and I didn't even know that was where it was when I was first in it with God. But when I asked him, that then set a pattern for my life and being able to cultivate and tend it and grow it and use my imagination to generate things that later on will be are and will be part of everyday life. Of choosing to create realities to live in. If you enjoy these videos, would you please take a moment to like, comment and subscribe? It really does help. Thank you very much.